Hi, I'm Naisha McCauley, and you're watching AccessTV.org. Uh, good morning again. This is uh, Jonathan Small, host and producer of All About You. Today is August the 19th, 2013. This program is broadcast live every week from AccessTV.org studios in downtown Hartford. This program is designed to give the guest a chance to give his or her life story, but many times we will get into a particular topic or a particular issue, which I am planning to do this morning. Uh, basically, I'm going to have a topic of a person that has a lot of expertise in history, philosophy. He has a world view knowledge on many different aspects of life. And basically, our topic uh, this morning is going to deal with violence, not just locally, but nationally as well as internationally. This morning, I have a well-known expert in philosophy, Dr. Kuba Asagai. Good morning, Dr. Asagai. How are you doing? Good morning. How are you doing, Brother Small? Oh, okay. It's got to look at me face to face. Yes. Okay. Could you kind of let people know before we get into our topic pretty much where did your life got started at? We all, our lives started in Africa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. uh, but I think that uh, I came out of England. I came out of Aston, Birmingham in England, uh, the UK. And in the 50s, grew up there with my mother, who you can say I was a single parent, but there's no such thing as a single parent among African people, because every, every child is a wanted child. The issue that I had growing up in England, which was I was the only black kid, or we will say colored kid, or some people take it to the most grotesque angle and say the darky, uh, on Albert Road in Aston. And I remember first going to school at Prince Albert uh, Primary School. And my first day at school, my teacher put me to sit next to this nice little blonde here, white girl at the front. <clears throat> I was the only black child in the school. She looked at me, I looked at her. She looked at me, I looked at her, and she screamed. And the next thing I felt that the teacher grabbed me at the scuff of my neck and dragged me out of the classroom. And put me to the headmaster's uh, office the following day, uh, well, in the end of the afternoon, I was given a letter to take home to my mother. And I, I, of course, I didn't know what it meant. Uh, the only thing I've learned to read at that time, and I knew it, you know, just by, because it was so popular at the time, rooms vacant, no Irish, no colors, no children, no dogs. And this was quite common throughout the neighborhood. So we just knew who the people who hated the Irish, who hated the blacks, and basically didn't want children or dogs in their houses. Uh, anyway, the following day, I ended up myself. My mother took me to school, and as we walked down the street, I could actually see this large crowd of white people carrying placards. I didn't know what it read because I that. And as we got there, my mother had tooled up, because my mother always tooled up during those days in the 50s, because it was she was concerned, as far as black people were concerned, nobody was going to put their hands on them without paying the cost of the intrusion. So she had this sort of cold wire she had in her bag. And as we walked down, and they were very brave, because, you know, these were some Cardinals racists who didn't want me in their schools. Apparently, I learned later on that they were saying that they didn't want me in the school because I was going to do eat their children or something absurd. And as we got nearer, there was another small group of white people who was at the side and they walked towards my mother, and my mother reached into her bag, anticipating that she was going to be attacked. And they came and says, oh, you know, and explained to her that you know, they heard what happened to me, and they came to support her. Well, my mother said, okay. And she just walked 
and my mother was one of those ferocious Caribbean women who, as far as she's concerned, she came out of the struggle of the, out of, you know, the cane, not the cane field, but, you know, the workers struggling against the, the plantocracy. So she walked towards them, and these people just scattered the side and walked straight through them and went in. And then there was this Jewish guy who was actually leading the group, uh, and he said to the headmaster, I be coming here to check that you all don't do anything to him, and if you all do, I'll have your guts for garters. And that was my first uh, real conscious experience in terms of what Britain was about. Um, I, of course, subsequently, I, I passed my 11 plus. I got into King Edward's Grammar School, which was this creme de la creme. And after that, I went into Royal Air Force. I got a commission, went up to Cranwell. And when I had enough, I left. I then went into university to read law, because in England we do read law as an undergraduate. And then I dropped out, mm. because I, uh, Herbert Chitepo, who was the chairman of ZANU, Zimbabwean African National Union, came and spoke at the university. And I spoke with him, and he, he told me, why don't you come to Africa and help us? And I was such an adventurer. I just thought it through and I ended up myself in Tanzania, in Dar es Salaam. I went to Kilikoni Ideological School, where I spent nine months, and then went down to Mozambique and uh, worked with the refugee camp there, the Zimbabwean refugee camp in the Tete region. So it was there that I got my guts. I got shot in my abdomen, lost my left kidney. And then I returned to England, got back into university, when this time at Polytechnic Central London. And from there, when I graduated, I went to SOAS. And after SOAS, I went to Cranfield Institute of Technology, which is, has now a world charter. It's now the uh, Cranfield University. I was very active, extremely active. As a matter of fact, uh, when I left the World Air Force, I joined the Panthers, the Black Panther Movement. Course, there was a Black Panther movement uh, in London, and I joined that, and we had a branch in Birmingham, et cetera, and so forth. Hold on, excuse me. Which particular year did you join the Black Panther movement, if you can understand? I that joined in 1972. Okay. 72. Uh, that was the time when it was petering out here, because we had people such as uh, Connie Matthews, who was a leading sister in Panthers. Uh, she was a, she was a, a part and parcel of the Eldridge Cleaver wing of the Panthers. Eldridge Cleaver at the time was in Algiers. And uh, later on, um, we got I got extremely active in terms of rent and what they were doing to our children in the school. It was actually something that I'd learned <coughs> because earlier in the sixties. There was a book written by Bernard Cord, who was the former Prime Minister of Grenada, who was uh, overthrown by the American, by the fascist Reagan regime. And uh, he had written a book with his wife, Phyllis, Phyllis Cord, uh, about the, the, the ill treatment, the mental ill treatment of black children in the schools in England. It was called How the British Education System Made the West Indian Child Education Subnormal. And he laid out a blueprint as what we needed to do to counter this mental assault on black children. So we were actually dealing with Saturday schools. So on Saturdays, we'll organize schools to teach black children to make sure that they excel, you know, uh, not just in the school system, but also within their community and understand what they were about as human beings. Because we had to counter that psychological damage, which was the foundation. 
why we are in the situation we're in. For example, well, hold on now. We talk, we're going to get into our topic today about violence. And you pretty much explained that your life, you lived in England, you was raised in England, and then you went into the military, you lived in Africa, you went into different levels, and then you came back to England. Obviously, you live in the United States uh, right now. So now we have a problem of we're talking about violence in our society. First of all, could you kind of define what is violence on a criteria level? What is the real definition of our violence? How I would actually put violence, I would say that violence, mental, spiritual, and physical violence. You see, we as African people have been subjected to all three. Uh, mental violence, and the fact is that we have been, um, we have been stripped of who we are. As a matter of fact, we're totally confused. We don't know who, what our history. We have got no connectivity with our history. Very few of us want to look at our African past, which is the etymology of who we are. As a matter of fact, it's the etymology of all human beings. If you look at the genomes, mm -hmm. and that says that we are the original people. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Leakey made that point years back, and he was dismissed as the, a crank. And subsequently, we now actually have this creation theory where the Khazar myth, where we were where we were created out to some potter's wheel and, and God created us, etc. and so forth. Well, you know, this is all nice, wonderful, romantic nonsense. Uh, mental violence, spiritual violence, it is all linked into the spiritual violence because if you look at the Bible or you look at the whole theological construct, it's not only that it depletes women who says that women was taken out of the rib of a man, Adam, mm -hmm. but also if you look at the depiction of the, the pictures inside, uh, inside these Bibles, you see that they're all Europeans. They all actually been taken out of Michelangelo's uh, depiction of the 16th Basilica and, and of the Vatican uh, that coupled with the that was in 1611 and therefore it just reinforced the notion of 1609 sorry uh, and it couples with um, with the King James Bible of 1611. And so, therefore, you have the vision of so-called Jesus, mm -hmm. uh, the 16 Christ. They never tell you he's the 16 Christ. Mm -hmm. They just said he is Christ, mm -hmm. and so he's the only one. This is not true. Uh, he's the 16 Christ, and of course, you have him being depicted as a European. And of course, even at the Last Supper. I always remember it, uh, but the Kwame Ture, Stokely Carmichael, saying that even at the Last Supper, they didn't even have a black waiter. Mm -hmm. uh, in in the case of, uh, since we now in the ear of the so-called butler movie, he, they didn't even have a black butler. Mm -hmm. So everybody there were white. You know, they didn't even have a Chinaman, they didn't even have an Indian, yeah. they didn't even have whatever. So, so, so that is an act of mental violence, uh, as a spiritual violence. Now we have the mental violence. No, you mentioned mental already. Let's get I, to sorry. the physical violence. No, now. Okay, the physical violence mm -hmm. is what they've been done to us. We strip, we've been stripped of who we are. We talk about beauty in the context of an alkaline feature. Of if the nearer you are to a European person, the more handsome and more beautiful you are. Uh, we have people who now practice racialism in terms of bleaching themselves, our women straightening their hair, mm. uh, people even going to the extent of altering their nose mm -hmm. or their, their mouths or their non-negotiables as I call it. Uh, that's a form of physical violence and to couple with that we inflict the ultimate physical violence on each other by menticide, what I call mental genocide where because we hate ourselves or we taught to hate ourselves so much that we have no problem going, taking a gun and shooting another brother, projecting the hatred of ourselves onto another brother. Well, let's get into that because when we're talking about violence and people see somebody get shot or stabbed or killed and then it needs to be dealt with is that's what people view as a violent act that exists in our um, society, whether it's locally, 
nationally or internationally. There's a lot of violence taking place in Egypt. There's a lot of violence taking place in our street corners here in America. There's violence in the military. But the bottom line is what can be done to really resolve the type of violence on a physical, or you say physical has a different level than just picking up a gun and or picking up a knife, stabbing or um, shooting somebody. But do we allow, if we're trying to solve this problem, is it up to the law enforcement? Is it up to the community? Is it up to the churches? I mean, who, how should we go about trying to resolve this problem of violence that we have with the end results of somebody being shot, stabbed, or killed? Well, violence has to be resolved by the community, mm -hmm. the total community. When we talk about policing, we're talking about the population having a sense of civil civility and a sense of normality and a sense of mutual and reciprocal respect for each other. Mm -hmm. uh, we tend to employ a police force, special force, train, whatever, and believe that that is the only source of remedying the issue. That, unfortunately, is a mess. Mm -hmm. uh, the police cannot police the community properly unless they police with the consent of the people. Mm -hmm. uh, if they don't police with the consent of the people, then they turn on the people, which in most cases they do do. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, I think that what you actually see in here, particularly in, uh, in Connecticut or in Chicago or yeah. those places, high uh, mentocidal area, I don't use the word homicide, because homicide is when someone is killing someone. Mm -hmm. With black people, black people are not killing people. They're killing themselves. Mm -hmm. And we need to understand that. You mean like the family is also being killed along uh, with the person that's well, being killed? Well, yes, we're killing ourselves. Mm -hmm. Because really is what we have had. And I was going back to the point, the three main points of looking at how we, we lack uh, the origin of who we are. We lack an identity of who we are, and because the identity we are given by the church, because most of us are wrapped up in the church, is an identity where we are a sideshow mm -hmm. of white people. And, and then, of course, upon that, we have white supremacy that tells us that we are nothing. For example, the dog and the bone. Mm -hmm. Now, if I ask you um, about what does a dog like, you say it like a bone. How do you know? The dog wouldn't perhaps like the steak. But because the dog has been acculturated to believe that the steak belongs to the master, then it's contented with the bone. Mm -hmm. Yes? And therefore, if it tries to eat the steak, it is dealt with in a very severe ma manner. And that is the issue where black people find themselves. If you go and look at philosophy, whether or not it's the three European sages, the Greek sage, of Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates, you'll find that in each of these, you have the mind, mm -hmm. those people with the mind, and those people with the body. Now, if you actually look at those that, that construct, you will see also in Eldritch Cleaver, Soul and Eyes, you, he talks about the supermasculine meaning, which is the body, the person who can run, people can box, people can you know, play football, people can dunk a ball and so forth. Those who are the physical uh, acclaims, the, what they call the physical appetite. If you look at who is the philosopher king, it is white folks. Mm -hmm. So in Eldritch Cleaver, Eldritch Cleaver says the omnipotent administrator, namely those who use the brain to plan, to organize, them, and the super masculine, you know, those who carry out the physical task. If you go to most, not all, but a vast majority of black parents today, anywhere in the United States, you hear them saying they want their children to get a scholarship. What type of scholarship? A ball scholarship. Mm. The physical. Mm. Not they want them to get an academic scholarship, but they want them to play, you know, to get a basketball scholarship or football scholarship. So they have been acculturated, just like the dog and the bone, mm -hmm. that they are nothing but the physical. 
they must not aspire to be the mentor. Just like a last thing again, if you try to critique white people, they think you're impertinent. Well, ask the guy, but so what they do mm -hmm. is they can critique you, but you mm -hmm. mustn't critique them. All right, well, let me ask you a question. You mentioned you know, black people being victimized in many different aspects and levels of violence, and you mentioned many times about white people. Are you trying to say that there's a conspiracy in this country, in this um, society, to have black people being killed or annihilated? Or are you just saying because a lot of our history that we're not well aware of and we are falling into traps, like you mentioned, with mental, spiritual, and physical violence? You know, you see, I don't want to use the word conspiracy because that carries a tremendous amount of baggage. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, it's, long, it's locked into the European the silly. Namely, if you cannot explain it, then therefore it's a conspiracy. It is a fact that as far as they're concerned, they want to wipe out African people. If you go and read Sidney Wilmheim, who needs the Negro? Mm -hmm. Sidney Wilmheim says, all the plates have been washed, everything, all the domestic chores has been done, we don't need them anymore. Mm -hmm. So what we have done is that we have created new vestige for them. And the new vestige we have for them is the what I call the prison industrial system. The prison industrial system is very important. I can also call it the European white, the male white supremacist uh, institution of containing black people. Mm -hmm. It's not an accident. We, uh, Michelle Alexander just finished the new Jim Crow, that there are now more black people in prison today than there were in slavery during the 1850s was the height of the slave population. If you read the 13th Amendment of the United States Constitution, it says when in terms of the so-called emancipation that Slavery and servitude can only exist through the due process of law. So once you get sent to prison, therefore, you are reverted right back to slavery. So the fact is, slavery is alive and well in America. Mm. Whether or not it's physical slavery in terms, of the men in terms of the prisons, or mental slavery in terms of all of these niggerization process that is taking place in our schools, in the school system, the public school system, where you are taught how to be obedient, where you are now caught in the dilemma of either, of either policing the crisis or be policed in the crisis. Mm -hmm. Now, you said that there's no such thing or there's no uh, conspiracy towards violence, that there's a fact. Please, please. I did say that. But, well, Hear what, what I said. What did you say? Hear what I said. I said that within the European asili, mm -hmm. which is a total different cosmology to who we are, there is a conspiracy. You use the word conspiracy. But within the African asili, it is a fact. Mm -hmm. We, the original people on the planet, have been stripped of who they are, have been turned into a sideshow, into a joke mm -hmm. of human specimen. And therefore, they get them, for example, they have gotten African people to believe that they are nothing. They will be nothing, and they have nothing to contribute to the world or to society other than being a sideshow. Okay. Well, let me say this, Asakai. There's no doubt about it. If you look at the numbers throughout the country, blacks disproportionate towards the population is being heavily affected by violence, particularly in our urban settings like Chicago, where I think it's uh, really an epidemic problem. But there's some time when you talk about how black people are being affected by violence, and, any, and even though innocent people could also and have been victimized towards violence, does that sometimes do some injustice for the black people who do not engage in any form of violence, who are doing what they need to do and are betting their self, even if it doesn't fit into what you view as what we need to be advocating? Because every black person is not killing each other. Every black person is not being victimized by violence. Um, now, you may disagree with that, but what does that say for people who grow up and don't carry guns, don't shoot each other, don't do destructive things, with their self in their own community. 
How do you view those people? Well, first of all, you're actually again you you engage in overboard statements. Mm -hmm. Do we have a community or we have a cemetery? Mm -hmm. What's the difference between the cemetery down the road and where we are now? Well, I always view the community like Dr. Claude Anderson stated is when you own control and have a direct state right. at what exists in right. society. Where? You live at. Would you say in Hartford? No, it's, it's not in Hartford. Okay, good. So in our fact, we don't have a community in Connecticut. No, we don't. Okay, good. So if we don't have a community in Connecticut, we are in the same situation as the corpse in the cemetery, aren't oh, we? Oh, would you say a black community? Because people will say you no, do have no. communities okay. in Connecticut. White community. Okay, but you don't see a black community. We don't community. see a black community. Right. Despite, and say for example, Hartford, where the vast majority of the population are, I would say, 80% Latino and African. Mm -hmm. Okay? What do we control? Even those Africans who are so called elected, I said so called elected mm -hmm. to the state or to the local uh, uh, municipal area, the city municipal authority, they're just sitting in the seat. They're just carrying water for somebody else. Mm -hmm. They're not actually representing the African and Latino community here. Mm -hmm. You and I know that. Mm -hmm. You and I know very well when we speak about the violence, and I say violence, shooting, etc., and I say this, you may say, well, some of us aren't doing it, but we might as well all be doing it. Mm -hmm. Because we're very honest with you, whether we all know somebody who got shot, mm -hmm. we all have been affected by the person who got shot and the person who have done the shooting mm -hmm. when they are Africans. We all actually know and feel the pain and the frustration of another brother or another sister dying uselessly. And if they are engaging in the self in destructive acts, they are not actually projecting. I mean, for example, when was the last time you heard an African, other than the brother over in Chicago, Chris, uh, I've forgotten him, the former policeman, where an African is killing a member of the oppressor group. Mm -hmm. We don't kill members of the oppressor group. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, African Americans particularly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I know you have. Well, kill. African Americans kill each other, but you have a lot of violence in the Caribbean. I understand so that. It's, it's, a, it's, a, yes. it's a worldwide yes. issue no, of, no, no. of violence. No. But you see, situation, you've got to look at that in terms of American hegemony. Mm -hmm. United States, I live in the Caribbean, as I was director in national security for the Federation of St. Kitts Right. in charge of youth at risk. And I will tell you one thing. The first thing that African kids throughout the Caribbean become acculturated to is American cartoons. Mm -hmm. American cartoon where somebody's always hitting someone, somebody's always engaged in some sense of insanity. If you go, I remember one time walking down McKnight, which is what you may call a ghetto in, in Bastia. And this young kid, what night? <laughs> he came out, said, man, uh, I'm going to do you, man. I'm going to do you, man. He'd never been to America, mm -hmm. but if you hear this kid and heard this kid behaving, you believe that he, he came out of the North End. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, I remember once sitting with my wife watching a program about South Africa, and they went into Soweto. Mm -hmm. And this reporter asked this little young black kid, What do you want to be? I mean, this is the time when they were talking about Mandela. I mean, not to say I support Mandela. I sister William Mandela is my 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 queen. Yeah. And I asked this young brother, "What do you want to be when you grow up? You want to be like uh, uh, President Mandela?" He said, "No, man. I want to be like Snoop Dogg, man." Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, where did it all come from? You got to understand the influence of the American media on the whole world. Has a the impact. influence on the American propaganda uh -huh. on the whole world. Uh -huh. I remember again in, uh, where was it? 
a crikey, it was in Kenya, mm -hmm. Nairobi. I was talking to his brother, and I said, well, you know, America think they're bad. Just look what the Vietnamese did to them. You know what he said to me? Mm -hmm. The reason why the Vietnamese won that war because John Wayne wasn't there. Mm -hmm. I said, what? He said, John Wayne was there, man. Those little, and he used the disparaging word for these people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you got to understand the effect of Hollywood, the effect of the American media to perpetuate the big lie. So if people are killing and behaving and acting out, say for example, in Kingston, Jamaica, right. mm -hmm. that's a classic situation, Waterhouse, or what they call Firehouse, uh, uh, West uh, Kingston, West Kingston, etc., mm -hmm. where people come out with a big gun and mm -hmm. this madness to get it all from America because America is seen to be the bastion of sanity. Mm -hmm. It is the panacea of life. Oh, you and I live here. You know, you know very well that's a lot of baloney. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you, sir. I'm asking God, when people <laughs> talking about violence and ways to prevent violence and ways to resolve violence, and up until this point, we haven't seen no real solid evidence of violence being reduced where black people are growing up most heavily affected by it. Um, is some of the ways that you think we're trying to solve violence, telling people that oh, if you have more job opportunities, you get better education, you get better mentoring, you get the churches and the <clears throat> religious aspects more involved in it, you get less single parent households. I mean, I hear so many lists of reasons why we have a major problem with violence. Um, are these the wrong ways that we are addressing how to solve violence? Well, first of all, what type of society do we live in? Mm -hmm. We live in a capitalist society. Mm -hmm. Capitalism is in crisis. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows it. No one talks about it. Mm -hmm. um, we have a situation here where I heard this morning that in Australia, uh, people who work for McDonald's are being paid the minimum wage there is $15 an hour. Mm -hmm. The minimum wage here, you know very well, is far less. Yes, it is. So why on earth in Australia, an American multinational is paying far more there than their pain in its home metropolis. Mm -hmm. Capitalism is in the crisis, and as a result of it, they wish to blame the victim of capitalism. Mm -hmm. Try to find every remedy except remedying capitalism. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at during the time of FDR, when FDR created the New Deal, and out of the New Deal came all of these things that we enjoy today that is now being reversed by the Republicans and the Republicans because that's what we have in America. Mm -hmm. We don't have a Democratic Party. We don't have two parties anymore or three parties. We have one ideology. Mm -hmm. We have two different groups but one ideology. We have the, the Republicans and the Tea Party. Mm -hmm. So we have always a neo-fascist and a crypto-fascist group. They all saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, they all want to talk about how to attack the poor. Those who have let more be taken from them and given to those who those who haven't let more be taken from them and given to those who have. Is that socialism? No. This is what we got in America. They they robbing the poor and giving it to the rich. You look at the situation the other day when um, uh, it was it when capitalism collapsed mm -hmm. in two thousand and eight. What did they do? They decide to bail out the bankers mm -hmm. who created the crisis. Did they give monies to the credit unions, to the community banks, etc.? Uh, here in Hartford, where they actually, where poor black people work their fingers to the bones mm -hmm. to buy homes, where they actually had to pay 10% interest mm -hmm. on their mortgage, 
They're now coming in and foreclose on their home. What is the action of the state? We have got one person, Doug McCure. McQuire? Douglas McCory. Douglas McCory. Representative. He is actually on the banking committee. Mm -hmm. Now, is Douglas McCory, who is seeing people's home being foreclosed upon, is he coming in the community so we can put pressure on the state so that the state can say to the banks that they must now remortgage the, the properties at the current housing uh, value, which is usually 50% less than what these people have to pay on. Mm -hmm. So if they have uh, a $300,000 or $200,000 mortgage, you can actually say to them, okay, you remortgage, but you remortgage at the present housing value, and the present housing value is about $100,000. And if the bank refuses, then the state should carry compulsory purchase of the property at the, its current value, which is a hundred thousand, and then sell it to the owners at a hundred thousand, and then get the three percent mortgage, and then keep the people in their homes. So therefore, force the bank to take the the haircut in terms of the reduction of the price of the house. Are they doing that? No, you're not doing that. No one is doing that. No one is talking about helping poor people, whether or not they're black, white, or Latino, mm -hmm. to actually hold on to their property. No one is discussing that. So you see, we're actually talking about an elected group of people who has no intention to represent the people who vote for them. Mm -hmm. Yes? Only those people who actually give them money Right. So that they can run their campaigns. We, you talked about the violence in terms of reduction. Look at look at Hartford. Look at the difference. They value the Jewish community over in West Hartford. So if you go over to West Hartford, just in case anyone wants to go over there to carry out any terrorist activity against the Jews, they've got CCTVs all around the place. Mm -hmm. Because their Jewish life is important. Yes, their life is important, but my life is important too. Your life is important. African people's life is important. Well, where are the CCTVs here in the Hartford? Yeah, well, where are the where are the the social mapping? They're not there, asked the guy. But let me just say this: you're trying to say that there's a connecting factor when you have a failed capitalistic structure and those other factors that's not being addressed. You also mentioned many times in this program that there's no real leadership that's really advocating our best interests. People people growing up, black people in inner cities in particular. We're not in the inner city. Well, we're, well, we're in an urban setting. No, no, no. North, we're not, we're well, not what in is a, the North and We're Hartford? not in an urban setting. Let us put the real context, put it in context. Mm -hmm. We're in a domestic colony. Okay. There's no difference between the way we here in Hartford or in in Chicago or in New York or in wherever African people live in majority lives mm -hmm. and say for example Jamaica mm -hmm. or say for example St. Kitts Nevis or say for example Barbados or say we are in a colonial situation mm -hmm. yes it just so happens that they live in a near colonial situation we live in a domestic colonial situation mm -hmm. and we need to understand the context in which we live in mm -hmm. Because really is that we are the product of jobs. Mm -hmm. we, are the, we are the people who they use for job creation scheme. We are the people who they produce, who the lawyers, uh, who the probation officers, who the correction officers, who uh, the, the shopkeepers, who the banks. We are the people who... The 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 lead chart. We're the product. We are the product. We're, yeah, we're the ones that's going into it, whether you want to define it, the criminal justice system right. or something. So else in fact is, so in fact is, we are no longer. It's, it's no longer. Uh, we no longer make products. Like we no longer go into a factory uh -huh. and produce a tool and say, well, this is a product. I'm going to sell it. We have become the product. Uh -huh. Yeah, as uh, as Ivan Illich says, the tools of conviviality. We are the one that making people rich, mm -hmm. yeah, and therefore uh, we 
any anything any act where we are tacked or non non uh, non negotiables becomes profitable for other people. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I, well, Asagai, you said earlier in the program, even if you are not directly being affected by violence, you're still somewhat affected by it because yes. it's in your whole family, it's spiritually, it's some. Oh, it's with, going to affect your you. children. Children, exactly. Because, self so example, let's put it up. Because this is another issue that a lot of these bourgeois Negroes mm -hmm. fail to comprehend. Now, I'm guilty of that. My family is guilty of that. We don't live in Hartford. We live in the suburbs. Is there a major difference? Really, if you if you really break it down, well, shall I tell you something? Shall I tell you something? The people inside of Hartford say about the place where I live that, and particularly about one of my problems, child. She lives in that area where they don't have any sidewalk. I didn't even know we didn't have mm -hmm. sidewalks. <laughs> okay. So you're talking about so well, Oscar, you're talking about a residential suburb. That's well, the residential suburb. At? I said the residential suburb, and the reason, the point I was going there is that people believe many of those petty bourgeois Negroes who used to live in Hartford, who now move out to Windsor, uh, Granby, and Simsbury, etc., into the suburb Bloomfield, wherever. They believe because they're out there, they're better than the people in Hartford, that they got a one man up. As a matter of fact, they're quickly ready to tell their cousins and their nephews and whomever family here in the Hartford, don't come calling my home, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, etc. Because as far as they're concerned, we are moving on up on the east side now. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is a crisis, a mental crisis, because if you look at the schools in those areas and the education that the kids are getting, it's no better. It's than no that. better than what you see in Hartford. Now, Asagai, you said if they say that they feel like they're better off, because I was always told by people that lived in whatever you want to call it. You don't want to say inner cities. You, you want to say colonialism or some other no, form. domestic colonies. Domestic colonies, okay. I was always told, Asagai, that people want to get out of these problems. They want to have better values for their homes. They want to have more land space. I even see people in the Caribbean who come to this country after a period of time, and they decide that they feel more comfortable in places like where you live at because you have definitely you have more land space. No, that's not true. You don't. Most of those Caribbean people live over there because guess what? When they came here, like everyone else, mm -hmm. they are told to not go and associate with those Black Americans. Mm -hmm. And as far as they're concerned, they want to live as far away as possible from Black America because they don't understand that they, like Black America, are in the same home. I was just going to ask you. To me, you're still in the same hold or the same boat, whatever right. that you want to call it. Right. But again, if you are able to get away from so-called the uh, direct day-to-day -day violence problems of uh, what you see in Chicago. But no, no, but situation. Remember, I said before that we cannot compartmentalize violent into physical, mental, and spiritual. Mm -hmm. It's all violence. Mm -hmm. The fact is that they live in the suburbs. They may not be subjected to physical violence, right. but they're subjected to mental and spiritual violence. Mm -hmm. Because look at where the churches are being built now. Look at where the, the so-called um, theology, uh, uh, where... This first cathedral, the, the first largest cathedral. mega church okay, in uh, New England? Right. No, you know very well. When they have a so-called uh, gathering uh, 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 finance for the first lady, she collects one hundred twenty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. The the pastor is his birthday, so he may collect a quarter million dollars. You know very well that if you don't have, if you're not in, if you're not a lawyer, a doctor, or a, uh, haven't been done well, Negro, mm -hmm. as I would call him, haven't been done well, you know. You can't go there. Mm -hmm. Because first of all, you have to buy a pew. I don't know if you've ever been to that place where you see people with their names mm -hmm. on everything. Uh, by the first time you get to, to what I call the, the, the stadium, I call it a stadium, there's a big picture, caption, depiction of a white man. Blonde hair, blue eye, 
I assume that he's Jesus. Mm -hmm. yeah? uh, and then you go in, and then they have the view. So if you can rent a pew, buy a pew, and go and show your W-2, which is your tax form, to the pastor, one of his deacons, to see how much you were earning, mm -hmm. then you can't be a member of the church. Because, you know, this is important. They're, not, they're there to, to, to sell souls. They're there to, you know, they, what do you call it, this uh, financial theology or something like that. So, you know, it's, 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 it's important that people understand this. These people are nothing but modern day pimps. So you're saying that's part of the problem why some of the violence can't be solved? Why you the problems cannot be solved because the people who has the ability to solve it are not do not have any intrinsic motive to do so. Mm -hmm. As far as they're concerned, if they're not gain, making uh, a profit from it, they're not interested. So that sounds like to me that you're saying a lot of people, particularly the people that's mostly heavily affected by violence, they're not really being told the truth. They're not being told the truth. Of course they're not being told the truth. They tell them the truth will be a revolution tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Does but, we need that? What? Does we need a revolution to really stop violence? I don't want to be accused of terrorism, promoting terrorism. You'll ask me that question because I might say yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. But up until this point, nothing seems to be working. So evidently, do you have any background? Nothing will work because there's not the intention to solve the issue, mm -hmm. John. This is not the, you look at it. Where are the African people in America? Where do they work? The teachers, the lawyers, the probation officers, the social workers. They're all in the police in the industry. Uh -huh. Now, they must have somebody to police. Uh -huh. Who must they police? Those innocent, unconscious-minded people who really believe that American capitalism is going to work on their behalf. Mm -hmm. Has it worked on their behalf? We remember what Anderson, Claude Anderson wrote in his, uh, he says, you are in a neighborhood, develop a product, that you can exchange, that you can sell, that you can actually have a multiplier effect within that economy. Mm -hmm. Are we doing that? No. Who owned the shops? Who owned the supermarkets in our communities? Mm -hmm. Who owned the banks in our communities? Who owned the commanding heights of the economy inside our communities? Who controlled the hospitals where we are receiving second and third class treatments in our hospital? Mm -hmm. Who in a, in, a, in a place like Hartford, who is the, the chief of police? Uh, what is the notion held by the police? Do they hold a notion that we are citizens, that we have the right to walk and to be free inside the community? Mm -hmm. Or are we seen as a problem? In the schools, what do we get? Do we get medicine or poison? Mm -hmm. in terms of the curriculum. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, what is this all go what's going on? And you're saying Are we having a discussion about it? Yeah. We don't listen, one of the things about African people here is that we do not critique our condition. Mm -hmm. Other people critique our condition. Mm -hmm. Our people deconstruct our condition, but we don't do it because we're too busy engaging in spookism. We run to the church and we hope that if we pray long enough it, our problem will disappear. Do our problem disappear? Mm -hmm. No. We believe if we actually go on the radio and we talk hype, or we go to a ball game and we fantasize, then everything will be okay. It will be all right tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, what is it? One day at a time, sweet Jesus. Yeah. Hmm. Well, Dr. Asagaya, I know you came to this country, what, in the 80s, and then you got deported, and then you came back to this country, and you joined so-called grassroots organizations. And I you, tried to. You tried. Well, you were, <laughs> but, but no, you was actually a member of one organization, African American. But um, they always alliance. tell me that, when I tell them the truth, you remember, you were that. 
Jonathan. Come on. That's my, you was told to get on a boat and go oh, to where right. you come from. Okay, good. Okay. Good. Thank you. So <laughs> they are, so I'm saying that's another part of the problem. You came here, you tried to advocate certain agendas that you felt would be more effective. They didn't buy into it. And, and what happened to them now? They're still singing the same old song. I, and I, guess I, what? You look upon it. Had they adopted the policies and strategies I gave them, what do you think would have happened? It probably would have been a definitely better results, um, but this is still a deep-rooted, systematic, systemic problem. A slave mentality. Okay. You remember what I said when I came here? They all live on a plantation, uh -huh. and they're quite happy being on the plantation. And one thing I've learned here in America, this is why I would say I'm no longer in the help in the help business, is the fact is that when you try to help people, they first of all, will turn on you uh -huh. because they see you <coughs> Sorry. They see you as the problem. So it's very much that Greek situation where they do not deal with the message, they deal with the messenger. Uh -huh. So the messenger, so the fact is, the messenger brings the message, tells them this situation is terrible. What do they do? Do they join with you to solve the, to solve the problem? No. They see you as the problem and they put you to death. Mm -hmm. How many times have they linked up with white people mm -hmm. here in Connecticut to try to get me deported? Mm -hmm. Again. Well, then again, ask the guy, it's not just you. Even Dr. Claude Anderson had a very difficult time when he tried to establish his economic plan throughout the country. Oh, yes, they'll so, get rid of him. Yeah. They'll get rid of him because he's a problem. Because as far as they're concerned, insanity is normal. Mm -hmm. Oppression is normal. Mm -hmm. Genocide is normal. Mm -hmm. Why is it normal? Because somebody somewhere makes a profit. So some degree, there's a certain level of justification why many people feel powerless that they can't solve this problem. They feel powerless because they're operating within the functionalistic system, uh -huh. and they're operating in that system, and they are trying to abide by functionalism, and therefore they cannot make any change to it. Well, I heard somebody a couple of weeks ago called the Reverend Al Sharpton show and mentioned something about Canada. You have a lot of open space in Canada you have a very lower population base in Canada, and maybe that the black people in this country need to start to look at certain areas in Canada to go establish their own community, that that might be something that could be looked into. Not saying that that definitely has to happen. I think even you one time mentioned that we should try to establish 15 different states, and that was clearly rejected by people that you advocated that towards too. <clears throat> Let's look at it. I'm glad you raised the issue about Al Sharpton. Al Sharpton is a pimp. Uh -huh. He'll be anything else. Yeah. He's now respectable because white folks use him as the engine for their canon father. He can go and start talk to black people about this and that and the other. I like to go back to Frederick Douglass. You won't talk about the history of African people. Frederick Douglass always says, I'm not just a man, I'm a black man. Mm -hmm. That puts me in total different to silly to the white silly. <clears throat> and he always says, you always put your bucket in your well there. Dig a hole in your own well. Mm -hmm. Now the situation is, there is enough For everyone here in America, the there is enough resources yeah. for everyone's need, mm -hmm. but there aren't enough for everyone's greed. Mm -hmm. And what we have is society based on greed. This is why Hannah Arendt objectivism has usurped the old biblical saying, I am my brother's keeper, or the Kantian concept of categorical imperative mm -hmm. means that I should care for my own family, my own neighbor, etc. So forth. The situation here is we could develop cooperatives here because capitalism 
financial capitalism isn't working. Mm -hmm. We need to have cooperatives where people can come together and share in the surplus of what we all produce. Mm -hmm. Not someone just come and grab the whole surplus and run off to uh, and hide it in in some offshore bank, which is the case. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> or, for example, you remember when uh, Colin Bennett was in charge here in the city and making sure that everyone had opportunities. Mm -hmm. Yes. Just before he died, mm -hmm. here's a Jamaican man came here. He got a big building, million dollar building over on, on Albany Avenue. Mm -hmm. But what is also significant is that did he do it all for himself? No. The garage over here that was on uh, 91, the black man who owned that place there, you remember him? What are you talking about, Abe Giles? Not Abe. Oh, no, not Abe Giles. No, I'm talking about the garage, the motor vehicle place. Oh, okay. That yeah? So I don't know that. Okay. He went to live in Avon. Mm. Made sure he got away from all these neighborhoods. A second, you also have a situation, what has he done? And I don't know what he did inside of Hartford to make sure that African people rose up. Mm -hmm. He sold them cars. Mm -hmm. Yes, everybody had a car. Did everybody have a house? Mm -hmm. Did everybody have opportunities in terms of schools and education, etc. and so forth? You know, I mean, that's the difference between him and Hoffman, who also sell cars, but make sure that the Jewish home, the Hebrew home, the, the Jewish uh, community center, and all those other things are well resourced. Mm -hmm. the, the Hebrew school that they got here is well, are well resourced. I didn't see this brother did that. Mm -hmm. And that is the difference about giving back about actually helping somebody up mm -hmm. rather than putting your foot on their neck and saying stay there because the more many the more you stay there the more money I make. Mm -hmm. And also and also Dr. Asagar, you have to have an economic, political and social agenda in place to really have what you need as a um, community. And if those could be some of the resources that could go towards really preventing and stopping violence, because right now that's not existence. The people who are going to stop violence here is one, those academics who really should be making a genuine and honest effort. Mm -hmm. Take somebody like Andrew Woods, let me call his name. Andrew Woods has been in the so-called violent prevention business for a very long time, hasn't he? Yes, he go back since the 90s, uh, I believe, in the community dealing with a lot of issues related to the youth and all that. What success has he had in this? No. The numbers still speak for themselves. The numbers speak for themselves. But if anyone, do you know the man, the person who, who Andrew Young, who Andrew Woods hate most of all? Could it be you? Mm -hmm. Okay. And you know, each one of those niggas around here, including the former mayor, Thurman Melvin, mm -hmm. you know that Negro would not have me to do anything to alter the course of events here. Mm -hmm. Because he would, as far as he was concerned, and as far as they're concerned, I make white people uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And because I make white people uncomfortable, and they generalize because it's not all white people I make uncomfortable. Those honest, sincere, sincere white people, they will support it. It is those people who want to make money off the suffering of the Latino and black people who are felt uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And poor white people too. That's and the poor same white people yes. who want to believe the myth that they're superior to black and black well, people. Well, Dr. That's the guy. we are out of time. I appreciate you coming down here this morning to give your honest views on what you see as the problem or what you think needs to be done to fix the problem. Again, this is our Jonathan Small. I hosted this program this morning called All About You. I had enjoyed my guests. I had also enjoyed this topic. As I say, this program could be broadcast every single week on accesstv.org network. 
And again, as I say, to everybody out there, have a very blessed day and keep the faith. Thank you. 